Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. It's so good hearing everyone catch up from the week. It's so good to see all your faces. We so look forward to Sunday mornings when we can gather with our church family and just have a great time together. We're so good to see everyone and especially see new faces out there. We love when uh, new people come to see what God's doing here at First Baptist Church. We want you to feel welcomed. Uh, love to uh, visit with you following the services. If it's your very first time, we'd love for you to pick up a welcome bag there in the lobby before you leave this morning. Also, if you want to text welcome to the number you see on the screen, we'll get some more information to you about First Baptist Church that way as well. Um, some of you, maybe you've been visiting for a while and you're still being like, well, how do I become part of the First Baptist Church family? There's not an altar call. What's the process for that? Uh, last week, Josh shared that with us a little bit and um, gave us some great information. Uh, you can go look on our website and there's a link that tells you where you can set up an appointment. If you'd like to talk to someone about church membership, you can always catch one of the staff members on the way out. Also, there's some, if you look at, there's some pieces of paper there in the lobby that has a QR code you can scan that'll take you to a place where you could get um, signed up for an appointment to visit with one of us that way as well. Also be in prayer for our mission team as John is away uh, this week with them. Our worship minister is with our mission training team in Honduras. They'll be praying for them, but uh, we're excited to have Trevor leading us this morning in his absence. Definitely, definitely praying for them. They had a, um, a rough time uh, in the airport, but they made it. Um, so uh, we're praying for them. You guys stand with us. We're going to sing, um, sing about the joy that we have meeting together um, as, the, as the church, as the house of the Lord um, that we are. So y'all sing with us. Bye. 
can have a seat. It's, it's an amazing Sunday uh, when we get to honor, uh, see, see somebody um, get baptized this morning. So we get to see that today. So you guys direct your attention. Well, good morning, church. I have looked forward to this day all week, and it is, is it, it's truly a pleasure uh, to get to see the baptistry full over the last several Sundays. And so uh, we give praise to the Lord for, for all that he's doing. And so today we have our sister with us, Miss Jenna Duhon. And Jenna, have you repented of your sins and trusted the Lord as your Savior? Yes. And she has. And so based on that profession of faith, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, dead of the old way of life, and alive in Christ. Amen. Uh, like I said, it's just so amazing to see that. Um, we're going to sing uh, again, and we're going to sing about the Lord's provision. We're going to sing a song called Honey in the Rock, um, just talking about how the Lord provides. Uh, so you guys stand with us and sing. Keep praising, you keep proving. I 
water in the stone Men are on the ground, no matter where I go I don't need to worry now that I know Everything I need you got is honey in the rock Let me sing your plan, power in the blood
This next song we're going to sing is a song called Worthy of It All. Um, and words uh, might be different for us a little bit, um, but they're taken out of the Revelation chapter 4. It says, And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And by your will they existed, and they were created. And then in Psalms, it um, talks about lifting up our prayers as an incense before him. And the bridge talks about, talks about that as well. So we're going to sing this song um, because he's worthy. He's worthy because of what he's done creation and what he's done in our lives. Um, so let's sing together.
Good morning, church, once again. Wasn't that a good time of worship through song this morning? And what an incredible reminder that he is worthy of it all. That, that God and the work of Jesus Christ is, is a worthy place for us to build our lives upon. And so we should give thanks uh, every moment because Christ is worthy of it all. Now, as we begin, let's open up in a word of prayer. And then let's jump in together. Bow with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you today uh, thankful that we can uh, be here together as a, as a local New Testament church. Or that we have the privilege of being able to join together, to worship together through song, to hear your word proclaimed, God. And also just to enjoy um, the community of being here together and gathering uh, around a common cause, God. And so, Lord, we give you all glory today because you are worthy of it all. And Lord, we're thankful um, for who you are and for what you do in our lives. And Lord, I pray that this morning that our time gathered together would be well spent, that we would be reminded of the truths of your word, and not just hear them, God, but to do them, to live them out and to apply them. Lord, we praise you. Um, we praise your son, Lord, and it's in his sweet name we pray. Amen. All sin is equal in the eyes of God. When, when God looks at sin, he sees it all as the same. Sin is sin. It doesn't matter what it is. Now, this is a slogan that I have heard countless times come from Christians over the years. And of course, when people say things, sometimes they mean different things. And so I think sometimes we can have good conversations. You know, and there's this idea in our society that you, sh you shouldn't talk about religion. Is that what Christianity teaches? Matter of fact, it says you should talk about it often. Why? Because you love the people around you. And, and I have come to found, find that, yeah, sure, you know, there's always people that get their, their feathers ruffled. But I found a lot of times when I talk about God's Word to people and I do it in a kind way and I, I listen to what they have to say as well, that we have good conversations. And sometimes it's a matter of clarifying terms and saying, hey, well, what do you mean by that. It's a good question to ask in, in discussions. And so today we're talking about all sin is equal in the eyes of God. And we are concluding this series that we've been in over the last three months. It kind of snuck up on me. I didn't realize it had, had been quite that long. And we've been looking at these slogans, these phrases that we hear in society, and sometimes we hear in the church, and sometimes the ones in society kind of slide in and make their way into the church. And we've looked at uh, numerous slogans. We've talked about uh, forgive and forget. Uh, sometimes you can't forget. Does that mean you can't forgive? Well, no. You can always choose, make a choice to not hold something against somebody anymore, to release their debt and to forgive them. We've talked about you are enough. It sounds great. It looks wonderful on a t-shirt. It's just not true. fact is we are not enough and that's why we need Jesus because Jesus was enough and he came and he did what we couldn't do and because of Christ, when I get to heaven and I stand before God, he no longer sees me. I will in fact be enough because Jesus was enough and that is the only 
reason. We've talked about faith is blind, that a lot of people say, well, you know, you Christians, you're just a bunch of airheads, you don't know anything, you just have this faith, you just believe and hope. We said that's not true. We're Christians because it's true. That's the foundation. And we see in God's Word and by examining the world around us that there are, in fact, good reasons to build our life on this foundation of Jesus Christ. We've talked about, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. True, you don't. However, I do need to go to church to be an obedient Christian, to be a growing Christian, to be a serving Christian. And so if you've got nothing else out of this series, I pray this, that from week to week, you were reminded in your, your daily affairs to learn to think Christianly. To hold everything we hear up to the light of God's word and say, does it add up to what God says? And that's why, I don't know if my kids love this or hate this, but whenever we watch movies together, sometimes we'll pause and we'll say, hey, what's going on here? What, what are they trying to teach us? What are they trying to communicate? Why are they making the religious person look like a buffoon? But then they're celebrating the sin over here. Do you see this, guys? Do you see the subtlety of the worldview that's being communicated? We've got to think Christianly. Right now, our staff at our church is reading through a book called You Are a Theologian. And sort of the underwriting premise is everybody's a theologian. We get to decide whether we're going to be a good theologian, whether we're going to think rightly about God and the world around us, or whether we're going to be a poor theologian. So we should hold everything up to the light of God's word. And so today as we close out, let's look at one final phrase together. All sin is equal in the eyes of God. Or maybe you've heard it said sin is sin or you know all sins the same. It doesn't matter. So let's talk about first of all if you're taking notes, well what does this slogan mean? Well this one's used in different ways and some mean perhaps that all sin separates us from God, which is in fact true. All sin separates us from God. So it doesn't matter whether you have an impure thought or, you know, whether you st steal a stick of chewing gum. It doesn't matter whether you've told a lie or whether you have embezzled funds, use God's name in vain. It doesn't matter. Any single sin will separate us from God. However, some people use the slogan, I think, in this way. And that is that God views all sin as equal. That, that sin is sin, you know. It's, it's all in the same category. It's all in the same pot that we shouldn't... Uh, categorize sin. We shouldn't say that this sin is worse than that sin because really it's all, all the same. But let me ask you this, is that a biblical idea? I mean, even before we get into the biblical data, does, does that make sense to you? To say that, well, you know, when the clerk gave you your change, she gave you two dollars extra and you didn't say anything about it, that's equal to the guy that goes on a mass killing spree because after all, sin is sin. Now, if, if we as humans inherently know that, that some things are worse than others, well, then surely God in his infinite wisdom knows the exact same thing. But let's ask this, well, what is sin? And we've talked about this before. Uh, my kids memorize these, these catechisms. And if you're not familiar with catechisms, it's simply this. It's simply a, a list of questions. Like, who is God? Um, who was Jesus? And then it gives a biblical response. And they learn a lot of Christian theology. And did you know this? We do this with our kids and children's ministry as well. That every month they get a question and they, they learn an answer to it. If, if you want to see your kids learn, grow in their knowledge, then catechize your kids. I can't, it sounds like a vaccination or something. Uh, and it kind of is. Uh, so catechize, this is your warning today. Catechize your kids. Um, where was I? Okay, so... The catechism my kids memorize says this. It says, what is sin? And the answer to that question is, sin is any lack of conformity unto or a transgression of the law of God. Sin is any lack of conformity unto or a transgression of the law of God. So sin is anything that a person does that doesn't conform to God's perfect, let me emphasize that, perfect law. So anything we do that God says not to do is a sin. Anything that God directly says we should do and we don't do that, that would be disobedience. That would be sin. And it's interesting. One of the words in the New Testament for sin is hamartia. And, and this is what it means. It means to miss the mark. And it means that when it comes to sin, it doesn't matter, you know, you've got dead center perfection bullseye. It doesn't matter if you're a hair's breadth off 
or whether you miss the target entirely, you have missed the mark. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned, that's the word, for all have missed the mark. And then it says, and therefore they fall short of God's glory. Whether it's an inch or a million miles, think of it this way. It's like trying to leap across the Grand Canyon. Now, in its, its narrowest section, the Grand Canyon is about a 600-foot distance to get from one side to the other. It can't be crossed. Even the, the world record long jump is nearly 30 feet. Can you imagine leaping? That's three stories, 30 feet. If I could do that, I would be like, hey, kids, watch this. I would be spider man across all the buildings, 30 feet. Even if you could on a good day with the wind against your back somehow superhumanly leap 100 feet, you're still not getting across the Grand Canyon. This is the idea of sin. That it doesn't matter whether you have a 5 foot leap and, or whether you have a 30 foot leap, you're still not able to get across the canyon. And the problem is there are consequences to missing the mark. Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. Now what is death? You say, well, I, I kind of know what that is. Let's talk about it. Death always involves this separation to, to some degree. When we die, we're separated from our loved ones, and our loved ones are separated from us. When we die, the Bible says this, that our soul and our body, we were made to be this composite being of soul and body. Those two things are separated. And so the wages of sin is death. Because of sin, we will die physically. Because of sin, we are spiritually separated from God. There is this canyon, this chasm that separates us. And if that's not dealt with, we carry that into the next life. And so sin brings death. It brings separation from God. And, and we would say this too, that in our personal relationships, when there's sin between us and someone else, certainly that brings separation. You know, when, when my wife and I have a kerfuffle, there is this, there's this separation. We're, we're not as close as we used to be, and surely you have felt that in your relationships as well. And so sin is, is separation from God, and that eternal separation is what we call hell. It's a place of quarantine for those that want nothing to do with God. And a lot of people want to get on their, their high horse and say, you know, this is not just. How would a loving God send someone to hell? Well, I say, how would a loving God force someone to be with him that wants nothing to do with him? Nothing. God, I don't want anything to do with you. Hell for them would be him forcing them to spend eternity with him. And so he says, thy will be done, we'll be separated for all eternity, death is, is separation. And so in this respect, sin is equal in separating us from God. But does that mean that all sin is the same in every sense? Well, every question we ask, we hold it up to the light of Scripture. Let's see what the Bible says about our slogan this morning. What does the Bible say? Let's begin with how are sins the same. Now, I'm just going to reiterate what we just said and how all sins are the same. Uh, James 2.10, last service I misquoted this and said 4.10, but it's James 2.10. See, I missed the mark. James 2.10, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Now, you may be pretty stinking amazing, and you may live as close to you can by the letter of what God's Word says. And everybody may look at you and be like, man, they good. However, James says, if you fail in one point, you bear the entire weight of the law. And spoiler alert, none of us have kept God's law. We are all guilty, therefore we are all separated, therefore we have the wages of death that we are incurring. All sin, no matter how great or small, will separate us from God. Now, before we get to how our sin's not equal, I think we should look at this as, as a bit of a warning. We shouldn't, those sins, I don't believe all sins are equal. We shouldn't compare our sins to the sins of others. Let me read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 to you. You know this verse. It says, it's for by grace, God's grace to us, that you've been saved through faith. We looked at this not long ago. Faith is trust. For it's by grace you've been saved through trusting 
and the Lord, and we said you had good reasons to trust the Lord, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith. Here's what I want you to hear. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, here's what I know. No one is going to walk into eternity with their chest poked out, saying, look, look at me, I, I made it, I got here. That's not going to happen. It's not the result of work, so that no one may boast. In fact, Jesus tells this, this story uh, where these two men go into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other one a tax collector. And it's interesting that the Bible gives that label. They were the most hated, seemingly sinful people in society because they were traitors. They were viewed that way anyway. And so the Pharisee, this was his prayer, and this is why we shouldn't compare our sins to the sins of other people. Pharisee prays, God, I'm so thankful. And he prays out loud, God, I'm so thankful I'm not like this guy. I'm so thankful that I don't have this laundry list of sins. I'm so thankful that I walk in your word and that I hold your law as important. This other man prays and says, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that my heart is corrupt and deceitful above all things. But God, would you have mercy upon me, a sinner? You know, it's easy to get to a place, especially the longer that we've been in church and we grow, to fall into a place of spiritual pride where we say, you know what, God? I'm, I'm, I know I sin. I know I missed the mark some. But I'm doing, I'm doing pretty good. At least I don't do what they do. At least I'm not like this guy over here. If we're not careful, we might even begin to think that, well, you know what, my sin isn't so bad. Yeah, yeah, sure, it's a problem. God doesn't like it, but it's not that. So it's really not that big of a deal. Let me tell you what. We are far worse than what we think. We are far worse than what we think. And sometimes God sort of slaps me in the face with it. And he reminds me that, that Josh, you are corrupted down to your very core. But I'm so thankful for the grace of Christ. Now, with that being said, how are our sins not equal? Now, there's a lot we could say here, but I want to point a few things out to you. When you look at the Old Testament and you look at sort of the Mosaic law, you, you start to see that there were different punishments for different sins. And if you want to look at it, you can go to Exodus 22. You can go to Leviticus 20 if you want to look it up later, that whole passage. You see that not all sins were treated the same. And that, that certainly makes sense. In the false household, there are different kinds of punishments for different sort of behaviors. If you talk back to mama, dad's going to be on you. Versus if you, you know, eat crackers on the couch and get crumbs everywhere, which is a forbidden rule in our house because nobody wants to lay down and fill those cracker crumbs, you know what I mean? Nobody wants that. And so still some punishment, but not the same. Then we could go to passages. I'm just going to read these to you for the sake of time. Luke 20, 46 through 47. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes. They love greetings in the marketplace and the best seats in the synagogues. And the place of honor at feast. He says, however, they devour widows' houses. And for a pretense, they make long prayers. He says, they will receive the greater condemnation. Now, I think it's interesting that Jesus indicates that some sins or some people will have greater condemnation based on their sin. Another passage that's similar, this is Luke 12, 47 through 48. It says, and that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will or receive a severe beating, a severe punishment. He says, but the one who didn't know and did what, and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating or a light punishment. So it seems that some sins merit more punishment than other sins. Then we have Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. Let me read this to you. Matthew 5, 21 through 22. Jesus says... You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. The Jews were well familiar with this. Yeah, yeah, we remember it. Mosaic law, all the way back to Exodus, Ten Commandments. We got it. Jesus says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will also be liable 
to judgment. Now, Jesus notes that it isn't just our behavior, that it just isn't just the outward expression of our actions that are, in fact, the problem. It's also we're held accountable for our thoughts. How's your thinking? Our emotions, our desires, all of those are problematic too. Then he goes on in Matthew 5, 27 through 28. He says, you've heard that it was said, you shouldn't commit adultery. The Jews are like, oh yeah, we remember that. Jesus says, but I say that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. That's a strong statement. You've got lust and you've got adultery, both sins. Jesus wants to make sure that we're aware that our sin isn't just our behavior. You know, we're pretty good at managing our behavior, especially when people are looking. But Jesus says that it's also our desires and our thoughts and our emotions. However, does that mean that being angry or hating your brother and committing murder are the exact same? Well, no. Because one is going to have far-reaching implications and consequences in this life. Now, one may lead to the other. They're both sin, but certainly one's going to have greater consequences. What about lust and adultery? Both a problem. However, one is going to create a whole extra set of problems, and we would do well to remember that we can choose our sins, as the saying goes, but we don't get to choose our consequences. And often, our thoughts, our desires, and our emotions, if left unchecked, will lead to a place where we act and behave in ways that we, we shouldn't. But our thoughts and our actions have real-life present implications. That's why Paul says this in Galatians 6, verse 7. Listen to what he says. He says, don't be deceived. Don't be duped. Don't forget. God isn't mocked. And for whatever a man sows, that also will he reap. Whatever seeds you sow and you plant, eventually those seeds are going to grow into something. And that's why the, the cost of sowing wild oats is so pricey. You pay dearly. The seeds you plant grow into something. And you have to deal with whatever fruit springs up in your life. This is a crucial way of saying that not all sins are the same. What we entertain in our mind, the desires that remain unchecked, the secrets that no one knows about, the sins that we commit, they will grow into something. Now let me remind us of this too. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're young or old, whether you are naive or experienced. We are one decision away from ruining our lives at any given moment. And you say, well, I don't know about that. Well, let me tell you what. I have sat down on numerous occasions and talked with people whose lives were in shambles. And it was from one poor decision. Now, we could argue and say that it took a while to get to that poor decision. It's why you need some guardrails in your life. So when you stumble, you don't go careening off the cliff. But we should never think that we are so far removed from any sin or any danger or any consequences. Will God forgive? Of course. However, he doesn't always remove the consequences in our lives from those sins. But we should note this. There is one sin that God will not forgive. And that's the sin of rejecting Christ. Of saying, no thanks. I'm good, God. I don't want Jesus. There's no forgiveness as we exit this life. For that, there couldn't be because we want nothing to do with God. But sin has different consequences. And in that respect, not all sin is equal. You can choose your sin, but you can't choose your consequences. Now, what's the problem with this slogan? Why shouldn't we use it? Well, first of all, two reasons. I think, number one, it's ambiguous, and so it's, it's best avoided. Because some people mean, well, yeah, you know, all sin separates us from God. True. Some people mean, well, it doesn't matter the sin. It's all the same. That is not true because we've seen this. There are different degrees of punishment. There are different consequences. And so if it's not clear, I think as Christians we should be precise and really careful with our language. So it's best not to, to use it. What else is the problem? Well, I think it minimizes the seriousness of sin. To say, what sin is sin or all sin is equal? It's not the full story. Because some sins invite irreversible damage into our lives. And not only that, unfortunately, into the lives of the people around us. All sin is harmful and there are consequences. But some things lead to lifelong, incredibly sad consequences. This is why, as adults, we try to warn 
the younger people that come after us, hey, I've been here. I made this mistake. It took me years to recover. Don't make the same mistake. And then as young people, we come through and think, yeah, but that's not going to happen to me. But what do we know? You reap what you sow. We're all really similar. Consequences are always on the heels of our sins. So let's talk about dealing with sin. Here's what we know. We, we know that we all sin. We know that we all have this problem. We know that we have all missed the mark. What do we do about it? Well, two thoughts. You need a bath and you need your foot scrubbed, your feet scrubbed. You need a bath and you need some good old foot scrub. And if you've got your Bibles, I want you to look at this passage with me. Let's go to John 13, 3. John 13, 3. Fourth gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And let me set the scene for us. The scene is... Jesus is in the last moments of his life. Now, I tell you what. If somebody told me, Josh, emphatically, you're going to die tomorrow, what would I do? You ever, th- you ever think about this question? Well, I, I don't know fully, but I know this. There would be Tokyo sushi involved. <laughs> and there would be Rayo's cheesecake and a cup of coffee. That would be on the menu a thousand percent. But what does Jesus do knowing that he's in the last moments of his life? Well, he chooses to wash Nasty, stinky feet would not be on my priority list. But let's, let's look at the story. John 13, 3. It says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He lay aside his outer garments. He, in taking out a bowl, he tied it around his waist. Taking out a towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter, who always had a lot to say. And Simon says, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what I'm doing you don't understand now, but afterward you'll understand. And and Peter objects, and he said, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Peter's like, I'm ready to take a bath. And Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed, they don't need to wash again, except for his feet. But it's completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. Now, I want you to note what he says to him in verse 10. This is the point I want to make. Pull some application from this. The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are. You're you're clean, but not every one of you. Now, I want you to think of it this way. The bath is salvation. The bath is knowing that you're a sinner and separated from God. The bath is trusting what Christ did for you on the cross, that he willingly died in your place. And if I repent, if I change my mind about sin, and I make God Lord of my life, he rules my life, he calls the shots, I'll be saved. Romans 10, 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For Scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. That's the bath. You only need one bath. Salvation is the miracle of a moment. It takes place once in your life. It is the covering of the blood of Christ that covers your sins, past, present, future. It doesn't have to happen over and over and over again because you have been purified, bathed, cleaned. However, unfortunately... We still sin every day. That doesn't mean I need a bath again. But it does mean that I need to wash my feet. That is to say, God, I'm sorry. I messed up. Our fellowship isn't close. Would you forgive me? That's the foot washing that sometimes must take place hourly. Maybe multiple times an hour. That we should keep an incredibly short ledger of unconfessed sin. And sometimes if you're like me, sometimes I I fall short, I miss the mark. And sometimes, it's hard to say this, sometimes I even do it on purpose. That I knew I shouldn't have did it, and I did it anyway. And when that happens, there's something in me that's like, well, I don't really want to go confess this because I did it on purpose. Let me tell you what, I don't think it's presumptuous at all. The second we sin, even if it's intentionally, to go to the foot of the cross and say, God, I'm sorry. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Salvation, the bath happens once. Confession, the foot washing, must happen daily. So we see 
there's our sins that are dealt with permanently. And then there's this daily. It has nothing to do with our salvation. It has everything to do with our fellowship with God. If we love the Lord, we want to stay close to the Lord. In the same way, I loathe it when my wife and I have something going on between us where we're not close. And it's usually my fault, right? That I've done something and there's this distance. There's this sort of terseness between us. So what do you do? Well, I have to go say, hey, you know what? I'm sorry. Shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have lost my temper. Sorry that I've had a bad attitude. Sorry for being a moron sometimes. Because I want to have be in good fellowship with my wife. That's why we confess our sins. What about dealing with temptation quickly? I'm going to give you three things real quick when it comes to dealing with temptation. First of all is this. Remember the consequences of sin. Remember the seriousness, I should say, of sin. Remember the seriousness of of sin. Keep in your mind that if you choose to sin, you choose to suffer. This is just the cause and effect. This is you reap what you sow. This is sin has its wages. No matter how good it seems in the moment, it isn't worth it. There is always consequences. So we must remember what Christ did for our sins. There's no, oh, this, was, this is just a little tiny sin. Well, Jesus' blood was spilt for that tiny sin. That removes that idea away that this is just a little small thing. No, it's not. Remember this, there's always a way to escape. Now we looked at this passage back when we looked at God won't give you more than you can handle, 1 Corinthians 10, 11. And a lot of times it gets twisted. Well, God won't give you more than you can handle, more circumstances than you can handle? Yeah, he will. But the verse says, 1 Corinthians 10, 10, 11, says no temptation has overtaken you that's not common to man. That means, you know, even though I feel like I'm the only one who struggles here, you're not. There's millions of other people that struggle the same way. No temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. But God is faithful. You can trust him. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to withstand it. But with the temptation will also come a way of escape that you might be able to endure it. We may think we're the only person that struggles in this way. God says, you're not. You're not that original. But God does let us know this, that you may be trapped in the burning building of temptation, but there's always going to be a fire escape for you to find your way out, that God as a Christian will not allow you to go through temptation that you can't get out of. It may be strong, but as you look around the room, there's always a way out. Now, I came across this quote this week from C.S. Lewis from Mere Christianity. If you've never read Mere Christianity, oh man, it's fantastic. But here's what Lewis says. He says, there is a a silly idea that's current that good people don't know what temptation means. You know, maybe sometimes people say, oh, you you Christians, you you goody-goody Christians, y'all don't know what it's like to live in the world that I live in where I am tempted all the time. C.S. Lewis says, it's a silly idea that's current that good people do not know what temptation means. He says, this is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it actually is. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes does not know what it would have been like an hour later. That's why he says bad people, in one sense, know very little about badness. They've lived a sheltered life by always giving in. Now, maybe you're in a place in your life right now, temptations come every day. But maybe you're at a place where you are struggling specifically with something. Maybe it's forgiving somebody. Maybe it's the this, this sin that no one else knows about that is persistent in your life. I don't know what your temptation is, but I do know this. Hold tight. Because the consequences are not worth giving in to whatever you're being pressured to give in to. Lewis would remind us that in, waiting in the wings is something good if we continue to press on. Last thought this morning, dealing with temptation. Can I remind you to be careful? Ephesians 5, 15 through 16. This is one of my favorite verses. And I've probably preached this passage more than any other passage. But it reminds me of something important. Paul says, Ephesians 5, 15 and 16. He says, look carefully then how you walk. He says, be careful, not as the unwise, but as the wise making the best use of your time. King James says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Being careful means that we consider every decision is what I'm about to do wise. Now, some of our decisions, they may not even be, it could possibly be, it's not a sin if I go this way, it's not a sin if I go this way. Sin isn't the issue. But the question is, is what I'm doing wise, is it going to lead me closer to sin 
or further away from sin. In light of my struggles, my past, my habits, my propensities, who I want to be a year, five years, ten years down the road, is what I'm about to do a wise thing for me to do? This question of being careful and seeking wisdom helps us to avoid temptation to put guardrails in our lives to where if we trip, we're not careening over the edge. So let's have our, our final flipped slogan. Instead of all sin is equal to God. How about this? All sin separates, but there are different consequences. All sin separates us from God, but there are different consequences. All sin is equal in that it puts distance between us and God. The wages is death. However, the consequences for various sins sometimes are millions of miles apart. So let me ask you, how is God inviting you to respond today? Most important question of your life is, are you separated from God? Is there this, this chasm, this canyon between you and God that no matter how far you can jump, you're never going to make it? And maybe you need this complete bath, this complete cleansing where God comes in and he washes away all of our sins and we are covered in the blood of Christ. Maybe this morning you're here and you, you need a bath. Or maybe you're here this morning and you're not close to God. Maybe you have unconfessed sin. If there is unconfessed sin in your life, you can't be close to God. And consequently, it's hard to be close to other people. Maybe you need a foot washing. Maybe it's time to say, God, I'm, I'm sorry. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Or maybe there are some sins that you've been tempted to water down. Well, this isn't really that, that big of a deal. I mean, at least it's not that. This isn't really a, a big deal. Or there's famous last words, I can handle this. I, I can do this. Or everyone does it. Or, or, or I have to. Any secrets that you need to confess. Any temptation you need to bring to someone else and say, I have had this monkey on my back. Tempting, tempting, tempting. And I've tried to carry it alone. I cannot do it. I'm inviting you in as a fellow Christian to keep this confidential and to hold me accountable here. Maybe you're flirting with sin. Maybe you're flying too close to the sun. God calls us to walk in wisdom. All sin separates us from God. But the consequences of sin is very different depending on the sin. And we can't choose our consequences. Let me read Psalm 51.10. It says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Church, might that be our prayer? Cle create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew within me a right spirit. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. Thankful that we can be here. Thankful for what you're doing in our church, Lord. Thankful for what you're doing in our lives. And we know this, that you're always active. You're always working behind the scenes, even when we can't see it, even when we don't understand sometimes the hardships in our lives, Lord, that we know that you love us, that you never forsake us, forsake us, that you're closer than a brother, Lord. God, that we can cast our cares on you. And Lord, we give thanks that as sinners, that through your grace, that you're willing to give us a right standing with God. Or this morning, if, if we haven't settled that issue in our hearts and in our minds, Lord, might today be the day where we can cast our sins on you, Lord, your work on the cross, knowing that they'll be erased. Or, Lord, maybe we're here and we just have these ongoing things in our lives that we're not dealing with. We know you. We just need that foot washing, Lord. Might we confess our sins to you? And, Lord, thank you for what you do for us. Thank you for this, this wonderful faith, Lord. We're reminded again this morning that you are worthy of it all. We can build our lives on you because it's true. You're our strong tower, God. Be with us. As we leave, as we exit, as we go, in through, our, go through our week, my, what you're doing in our hearts, fill into the hearts of other people. And Lord, would you bring us back here safely next week. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Amen, church. Let's sing in response.